Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Popular Music Books in Process series, a joint project of IASPM US, the Journal of Popular Music Studies, and the POP Conference. I'm Carl Wilson, one of the series organizers, along with Eric Weisberg, Kimberly Mack, Francesco Royster, and Gus Stadler. You can find our whole calendar on the IASPM website under the Journal of Popular Music Studies tab and get our mailing list by contacting Eric Weisberg. You can also catch up on videos of all of our past sessions on Eric's YouTube channel, including our last session on extreme music with Michael Tao. Today, we're very happy to be talking about disco and LGBTQ music with Louis Niebuhr and Barry Walters. Let me give you their bios. Louis Niebuhr is professor of musicology at the University of Nevada, Reno. His research areas include avant-garde and popular music of the post-war era, including music and radio, television, and film, and the significance of music to LGBTQ communities as it has shifted between live music, the jukebox, and the disc jockey in the context of queer spaces. His book, Special Sound, The Creation and Legacy of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, um, came out from Oxford in 2010, was the first monograph to situate the BBC's electronic studio within the context of popular music. And his current project, Menergy, San Francisco's Gay Disco Sound from Oxford in 2022, traces the way disco and high energy dance music channeled the spirit of gay liberation through a shared dance floor experience. Barry Walters has been documenting the intersection of mainstream and LGBTQ culture for nearly 40 years, starting at the Village Voice, where he came out professionally in a 1986 Pet Shop Boys review, then contributing for decades to Spin and Rolling Stone, where he was made senior critic. Walters became in 1992 the first critic accorded awarded by the National Gay and Lesbian Journalists Association for his work at the San Francisco Examiner. In the 90s, he also became the Advocates Music Columnist and for the next 10 years wrote much of Out's music coverage. Since then, writing for Entertainment Weekly, NPR, Pitchfork, and other outlets, and made a Sylvester mini doc in 2020, winning a Clio Award. And for the last years, he's been otherwise focused on his first book, amazingly, Mighty Real, The Music That Built LGBTQ America for Penguin a history of popular and underground sounds integral to queer identity and liberation. As always, during the conversation, please post your questions as you think of them in the chat sidebar. And at the last part of the session, Francesca will use them to call on you for the Q&A. And of course, we also encourage you to use the chat for comments and conversation. And finally, now I'm very happy to ask Barry and Lewis to take it away. Thank you, Carl. So Lewis, I've got uh, a bunch of questions for you. And uh, uh, your book's introduction begins with a night out at the stud that inspired this entire project. Uh, I believe I was there that same night. Uh, Did we dance together? <laughs> certainly uh, not far apart, uh, given that it was it's such a small, well, I have to put it in the past tense, but um, because it's no longer around. Um, but for the benefit, uh, I, it, that begins your book. You explain this. But for the be benefit of those who haven't read your book, can you please explain that scene and, and how it inspired you? Sure, sure. Um, oh, those, <laughs> those amazing nights. Um, the, uh, the collective Go Bang has been hosting these um, parties for years that center around queer DJs from all over the country, but um, they're centered in, in San Francisco. And this was one of the parties I had heard that they um, do an annual uh, an annual party at the stud celebrating the music of Sylvester, but not just Sylvester, but also the music of other San Francisco based dance music artists, usually primarily out of Megatone Records and Moby Dick Records. And uh, so we made, my husband, David George and I, we made our annual, well, not annual, we go all the time, actually, <laughs> trip to San Francisco and uh, brought our friend Eric and Scott with us. And we, we those those weekends are usually a total wonderful disaster, you know, like, like good gay tourists. We pour into the Castro and South of Market and three days later, we sort of stumble our way back home. Uh, and the party at the stud that night was, um, just filled with music that I had been listening to privately 
uh, for for quite a while, you know, just in search of what my new, what a new project could be in my own sort of deciding to center the music on stuff I loved. And so uh, being there on that dance floor, hearing these songs, it was a completely different experience, hearing them in a con the context of a club with people who are all singing along or just just carried away by the music and uh, just beautifully moved. And it was hot that night. It was super hot. And, and they had flyers of Sylvester all around and Patrick Cowley and different people. And I remember um, that Josh Gamson was there and a, a story I left out of the book was, um, he came up to me, I was crying, right? They were on the dance floor crying like a big baby. Uh, just so moved by the whole experience. Uh, Josh Gamson came up to me and said, what are you on? <laughs> <laughs> or he said, are you on something? I'm like, sadly, no. I mean, this was this is not a drug-induced experience. This is a, a musical experience that has moved me so much and an experience of community. And th that was really the point at which I knew that that's, that had to be uh, the next project. I know exactly what you're talking about, that you could be hearing the happiest music and it can release something in you uh, that people who've not heard this music in a public context, they will just never know that. Um, they, will, they just won't understand the depth that this music can have. Uh, so at what point did you realize that there was a book in this? Well, I think it came about because um, I, you know, I originally I think to go back, not to go back too far, but, you know, my very first record I ever had was um, Doctor Who the Music on vinyl. And it was an album of synthesizer music and it, was, it changed my life. You know, here I am, a little 12 year old gay boy in the suburbs. Like, what is this amazing electronic music? And then the second record I ever got was the soundtrack to Electric Dreams, the Giorgio Moroder produced soundtrack. And uh, it was, I see them as essentially two sides of the same coin, that sort of nerdy sci-fi music. And then the uh, this pop music, electronic pop music that would essentially be called Euro disco, you know, in the, in the, in the seventies. And so those two things as, you know, as I got to high school, um, I was torn on the one on the one hand between my sort of super the only way to be out in high school in the 80s in Kansas City was to be punk rock. That was the only community that accepted queer people. And so <clears throat> my version of punk rock was different than all the straight skater boys who were listening to West Coast punk. And I mean, it was, I love that music. But for me, it was the other stuff that got me beat up in high school, which was Bronsky Beat, Communards, Erasure, Pet Shop Boys. That's the music that I used to create my own identity. And then when I went to college, it seemed to be, I focused on the Doctor Who side. After I finished then the book for um, the, the Radiophonic Workshop book, I was like trying to think of um, where to go next that was just as honest to myself, you know, that if not even more honest to my own, uh, my own passions. And uh, I thought back to those high school, that high school music. And I thought, well, maybe I need to be writing this book. I'd centered everything in the UK in my research so far. Maybe I need to write that, that sort of second British invasion book. But as I started listening to it, I, I realized, sorry, this is a long winded answer. I realized that that music wasn't original, it had an origin. And I didn't know what the origin of that music was. And so I sort of went back, discovered disco really as not a joke. I mean, disco as a serious musical form, a style of music. And then I discovered Sylvester. And it seemed like Sylvester and Patrick Kelly were the confluence of all of these things. They were, they were Euro disco, but they were different. They were so gay in a way that Euro disco don't go wasn't. And it was American. And I had never heard of American high energy music before. And I, th I thought, this is, this is really interesting. How is this tying all of these things in together? I mean, those British acts were telling queer coming of age stories. And the music of Patrick Kelly and Sylvester, that was grown up music. 
kind of like why I wasn't ever into house in high school. That was like nightclub music. But making those connections in my head, I realized, uh, I realized this is a story and it's also a self-contained story in a way. And it's a story that I have proximity to living in Reno. We consider ourselves <laughs> Pacific Northwest, like, like San Francisco. And in fact, it was Norm Hershey. We ha Hi, Norm. We, uh, we had a, a talk once and Norm, Norm said to me, I like the fact that this story is kind of self-contained. It's tragically self-contained because everyone dies. I mean, there's an ending to this story in a way that not a lot of music stories have an ending. Uh, God, that sounds so calculating and awful, but but it's true. It's it really is kind of a self-contained, brief story. So that's sort of how I got there as a as a book. And and how did you start going about writing it? Uh, what was okay. your research process? Uh, well, my my tradition is as an archivist. You know, I, the Radiophonic Workshop book was all archives. That stuff was in the fifties. Um, and so digging through papers at the BBC and that bl has bled recently just over into, I suppose for the last 10 years, I've done a lot of uh, just going to queer archives, taking millions of pictures, taking a lot of notes on everything, not really knowing where it was going to go and not really necessarily having a project attached to it, but just drowning myself in, in this sort of secondary documents. Um, and by that, I mean like bar rags, primarily bar rags and um, other ephemera from nightclub culture over the years. It, it was always a, a larger plan to, to work on a history of music, like I said in, the inter in my little bio, to work on a project starting from, I guess, the transition of live music to pre-recorded music in gay spaces. What were on those jukeboxes? That was the big question I asked myself. What was the difference between those those queer jukeboxes and uh, and the and country western jukeboxes, uh, other kinds of jukeboxes, and how was that defined in the late fifties, early sixties? If there was a difference, and so then moving through that research, um, the San Francisco Archive, the amazing historical society archive in San Francisco, just has incredible incredible materials. Um, they need they need more resources. That's for sure. You know, it's a small archive considering the size of the city. You know, it's uh, very very um, like all archives needs needs money, <laughs> needs infusions of cash. But I just spent a lot of time there, and then I realized, oh wait, I'm gonna have to. It was an excuse. I told myself that everyone was dead because everyone was not dead. You know, there were quite a few people who were still alive who could tell these amazing stories, but I had no way in. And um, events like that, uh, like the, the the event at the stud, I met uh, Jason Williams, Sylvester's partner mm -hmm. there. And I met um, I met a couple other people that night who I and I did a lot of cold calling, you know. Um, luckily, everyone I am talking to is now in their 70s and 80s, so they're all on Facebook. <laughs> and so there's lots of like, I wonder if this person is alive. Um, and spending a lot of time on the um, the, San, the the Bay Area Reporter's obituary site, mm -hmm. you know, crossing off nine out of 10 names because they would have died in the 80s of AIDS, AIDS-related illnesses. But then that one person would still be alive and I would send them a message. And all that cold calling really paid off because um, once you know a few people, then they're, they're like, they know you're real and you're not a creep or you're, you know, you're sincere. And they're like, oh, well, you can, you should talk to him. He's not bad guy. We ended up having these ridiculous three, four hour conversations <laughs> pretty much, uh, which were amazing. And I, you know, having to then compress that stuff down to, to narratives is, as you know, really, really difficult, but I've had that experience where people have just been waiting their lives to tell their stories because the mainstream press has not asked them these questions. And, and so it becomes a, a, a question for us of what, what to leave out rather than what to put in. Totally. Um, so 
your your book draws extensively from press accounts of this scene, some in the mainstream press, but much of it in the gay press. Was that all accessed through the historical society or libraries or? Well, I don't given, um, the, given the fact that you did, I'm sure, much of your research during the epidemic. How did yeah, you yeah. get? Well, luckily, I did. I had I had the materials from before COVID. Okay. Like I said, I would go a lot and take. I hadn't really processed a lot of the information yet, so I was able to spend a lot of COVID <laughs> doing that, doing that part of it, just going through all of the all of the files. Um, there's a there are a couple things. The fantastic archive, the, the one archive in Los Angeles, which is just unbelievable. USC has it, which means that it's cataloged by USC. So they have all of this money behind it. So things are actually uh, really well organized there. And um, spending some trips in Los Angeles in that archive was really, really productive. And of course the archivists know everything. So they can connect you with other people and say, if you're interested in this, you should look at this. And so it, I'd say it was a combination of that. Um, I was very lucky to have a graduate student at NYU um, who had come from Reno. She was able to get some stuff for me at, in New York um, because I couldn't afford to travel to, to New York for, for this research. So that was really helpful. but. But primarily West Coast sources. And then lots of, you know, like anyone does, lots of time on eBay and uh, getting things. And Josh Gamson was very generous with his Sylvester archive as well. Mm. Took a trip, uh, David and I drove up to Lake Tahoe where he was at a summer camp with his kids to pick up a giant uh, crate of materials. He's like, take it. I have nowhere to put all this stuff. Wow, so Great. that was a treasure trove. Your book covers an era for LGBTQ people that's not just historically and culturally rich, but one that's also packed with a lot of emotional trauma and loss. And I'm not just talking about AIDS, which of course carries in of itself a monumental weight, but also the drug addiction, the sex addiction, and the other harmful behavior that went with a scene that was initially really about liberation, but engendered the very opposite. Um, what, what were the prof professional challenges of, of diving so deep into such serious stuff? And, and what were the personal ones? Yeah, that's a really good question. If we, if we talk about those, um, those other kinds of critiques of clone culture that, that you brought up, that the sort of superficiality of the culture, the sort of the intense drug use in that, you know, completely inherent in the culture. It was something that um, the people I spoke with, very few of them had regrets about. Mm. They never saw that as a, a, a problem. In fact, one of them, one of my informants still refers to himself as uh, Roarer, which is the, the company that made, you know, uh, Quaaludes. And he's like, that was my nickname. Um, so these are the survivors, though, in a way. And right. so some of the stories you hear about uh, mysterious deaths, especially um, especially before AIDS, really uh, hit home in a way when when people are describing, oh yeah, that person isn't here. Oh, that was bad. Oh, I I haven't been there for a while. I don't do that anymore. Um, my memory is not what it was. Those kinds of things. I feel like I tried to I tried to tread those waters carefully in terms of letting my informants tell me their stories and not sort of guide the stories. I would ask. My fear was always that I that people would be worried I was trying to get gossip. Like, mm -hmm. tell me about all the drugs you did. Right. Tell that I was trying to tell this sensational story. Tell me about the most harrowing death that you recall from those days. And it is a part of the story, certainly, but the trick is for me was to um, to focus on, I don't want to say to focus on the music because this is a part of the musical culture, but to always go back to how the music is um, a part of this culture of which that is an element. It's why I devote that section to the four Ds uh, in the book, you know, which are what? Disco, dish, dick, 
and drugs. <laughs> And so we have those four constituent parts of clone culture in the 70s, and they, they each have a part to play. Um, and I was not judgmental, I guess is what I'm saying. Having grown up in the Reagan 80s, uh, I was not going to be that person. Now, the AIDS stuff was different because it was so complicated. That to me was, that was the real there are so many ways of thinking about what the epidemic is and was about. And uh, I, I only have my personal experience growing up in the 80s, um, my terror, everyone assuming I was going to die before I was 18, um, that kind of thing. But to, to be speaking finally to people who were survivors, that was uh, that opened a lot of wounds, I have to say, for a lot of people when they would. Um, especially someone like Linda Imperial, who as a woman was just sort of watching all her male friends going one by one, you know, dozens and dozens of people, um, till essentially she had no career left because there was no one else to, no one left to perform with uh, for a long time. And that, that, you can tell people have spent decades trying to build their lives back from that which is why it pisses me off so much when the British British music gets all the credit for having invented high energy music when all they did was sneak in while everyone in San Francisco was sick. Right. Um, it, before we go any further, it, would you like to read from your book uh, or should we just keep going with these questions? Do you mind if I show you guys a, a couple of slides? It might Please help contextualize ahead. a few things a little bit. Um, I'm gonna share screen real quick. Um, so what you're looking at is a, a, a fantastic cartoon from 1977 from the, the gay magazine, A Different Beat. And that, what I love about this is it shows the centrality of disco music to, to gay culture. The fact that these guys, these clones, are communicating only through disco song titles. <laughs> to me, to me, this is this captures everything, and uh, the sort of the cruising, like the initial cruising, leading to sort of them hooking up. Everything can be articulated in, in terms of disco, and that this is before the invention of so-called gay disco. What they're doing is they're taking mainstream straight identified music and then reapplying it in this interesting way to apply to, to queer lives. And I just love, <laughs> I love this. Now that I feel love, I got to have your love. Let me give you the best of my love. Don't be cold as ice. Now I'm back in love again. I mean, the idea of the people dismiss these lyrics as, you know, as mindless. And it's true, the, 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 it's never really about the words or very rarely about the words. But then, you know, this was the, Thing about clone culture it was a party culture and so these lyrics make perfect sense but one of the things that i thought was uh that really grabbed me and i know we're uh, going to talk about a little bit later is sort of the some of the musical characteristics that marked out the san francisco sound as as pro did not just pro disco but disco obsessed post disco demolition night um so disco demolition happens in 1979 and everyone says disco is dead, but disco does not die in San Francisco. This is one of the things I hope that um, I have in my book. And there were the three things I really single out in, uh, in the book as characteristics of disco. First would be this amazing rising chromatic bass line that you can hear in this Paradise Express song. <laughs> so distinctive isn't it you, you hear that it is it you know larry graham was the first person to do it but then it makes its way really into the disco language it sort of stands in for disco for so many people and the other is that earl young offbeat hi-hat that hissing hi-hat that characterizes so much of the forward momentum of disco like like in this <laughs> It's 
such a characteristic of disco that that offbeat hi hat that that both of those qualities become like uh, untouchable in terms of wait is that the right word meaning you can't do them after 1979 if you do that in your music after 1979 you're dismissed as disco you're dismissed as you know as a part of that bandwagon or that trend that's no longer fashionable. And the other thing is this outrageously sexual, sexual lyrics, like in Love and C Minor, with this. I mean, it all comes from Donna Summer, <laughs> Love to Love You Baby, but you know, these songs get worse, bigger and bigger and more over the top. But then, but then San Francisco does it. So here we are in 1981. Uh, you have this Boys Town Gang song, um, Disco Kicks. And they're, they're not only not ashamed of the fact that they are doing disco in 1981. They're just like, they are reveling in it. Listen to this. That's a, that's like a, like a statement of intent isn't it they're like we're starting the song using this bass line it's like we're not embarrassed <laughs> you know what i mean we know you still want to hear that bass line and we have in something like patrick Kelly's menergy this <laughs> That's, this is the Cowley Gallop, but we had that offbeat hi-hat again, so, so memorable and so obsessed with its electronics. I mean, you could argue that it's a budgetary thing, but it's not. It's an aesthetic choice, this sort of sci-fi language of, of, of Menergy and Megatron Man. And then the ridiculous, look at this album cover. Isn't this fantastic? You couldn't do stuff like this during the disco era. It's only when people stopped listening that you could do stuff like this, that, that the mainstream stopped listening. You could do stuff like this, where in the middle of the song, Cruise in the Streets, which consists of nothing but cruise in the streets, <laughs> over and over, repeated it over and over again for 14 minutes, you get this amazing street scene. Got a cigarette? Sure. Thanks. Beautiful night. Sure is. Come here often? Mm, not really. Yeah, I've never seen you here before. You're a hot man. Hey, you're kind of hot too. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the incredibly gay version of Love in C Minor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the police. Ah, oh, shit. All right, what are you fags up to? What do you think we should do to him? I know just what to do to him. Up against the wall, you <laughs> asshole. You too, cunt. Oh, that woman's voice, she's the prostitute who likes to watch hot guys getting it on. And this is like this whole story told in the middle of the song. And then there's Paul Parker. Don't you love this picture? The fact that the albums, the records were sent out with a sticker of this on the front. So you knew that it was essentially, you knew that it was the musical analog of clone culture. What you were hearing was what clone culture sounded like. And again, it's a distillation of, of disco. That off the Sorry, the, this music, I love this music so much. Anyway, I just wanted, I feel like we hadn't, uh, if people weren't really familiar with what the music sounds like and how different it is from disco. It is disco, but it's a different kind of electronic disco. And that that to me is what makes it interesting. Well, I, I moved to New York in 1979 uh, to go to school and it, this was, the the summer that that late summer after right after the disco demolition 
And the idea that disco died it, in New York was an utter joke because everyone from the boutiques you would go to, like if you would buy jeans, if you would get a haircut, if you would walk down the street because boom boxes were at this point, it was just before the Walkman or before the Walkman became you know, a, a thing that everyone had. Music was very popular and they were all tuned to KTU, the Disco 92 or WBLS, which was the black owned radio station version of that. So I, I, I have to say that I remember listening to um, a dance music countdown and when they got to cruising the streets the it it played for a while and then the dj said well i can't i i have to fade the record out now because i can't play the rest of this <laughs> on the radio but you know there there was plenty of really sexualized music um that that played throughout new york in a very public way um, but, you know, that wasn't necessarily the case in most, in many cities that did not have a substantial Black population or a substantial gay population. Um, so it's really rare that a book like this is written by someone who can analyze the music from a musician's perspective and, and get into chord progressions and harmonic structure. How did you deal with the challenge of writing about that for an audience that includes many people who just don't understand music theory? That's a great question. And it's something that, sorry, our son keeps changing here. It's um, it's something that, you know, I, I deal, people who write about popular music and musicology deal with all the time because you just, you know, you're, you're, you're writing an academic book, but you know that there are people out there who are interested in the topic who, who don't really care about that side of things. So it, it, it does become, you know, there's a, there's a musicology journal, 19th century music, and I don't know if they still do it, but they, they do the music analysis part in a smaller font. It's so bizarre. It's like suddenly you've entered the theory section of oh. the paper, almost as if, if you're not interested, you can just skip that part. Uh -huh. And um, I have to say, to some extent, I do do that in a way to try to make it, I don't make it central to the story. Now, I'm lucky in, in the terms of this book in that, in that certainly harmonies aren't all that important. Uh, it's, it's a about rhythm, rhythm and polyrhythm is what really matters to this music. And then the technology behind it, the production techniques and the production technology. But I do find that the, absence of the importance of harmony is part of the story and so to talk about what are the harmonies used or for example and you make me feel mighty real the fact that we have this set of jazz chords being used i find really interesting it shows tip lyrics origins you know in a kind of almost progressive rock place uh, and those things help to me uh, expand on the story uh that um that i'm telling it's it's a it is to some extent flavoring, I guess. <laughs> it's the the salt and pepper, the seasoning, I guess you could say. But you can do you can do it without it, I guess. But I do think it's essential. You know, I learned from my dissertation advisor, Mitchell Morris, the importance of transcription and how transcription can, you know, transcription of taking the music and notating it. What you have to do is you have to decide what's important in what I'm hearing. What, what is the part of the story that this transcription is telling and why is it necessary? And he wrote a, an important article on the Weather Girls. And, and he showed the first time he, by isolating various elements musically, the song made sense to me in a way it didn't before. And that's why I feel like that transcription. I'm the nerd that sits down at the, with the transcriptions in a book and plays them through on the piano to say, oh yeah, that's, that's what's happening there. So, so yeah, I just feel like I, um, there is, there, there could potentially be pressure in an academic book to, to, to have a lot more of that. It's just not the, it's just not my style, I guess. When I, uh, 
wrote and uh, co-produced the video on Sylvester for Amazon Music, I had the opportunity to interview Tip Warrick. Well, he, James Warrick. He doesn't like the tip part anymore, but um, it was one. It was my primary goal to say, "Hey, can you play us? You make me feel mighty real." Because I was convinced that something really magical is is too strong a word, but something profound happens in that record that has allowed us to bring it into LGBT. Q festivals. It's and it's not just the fact that Sylvester manifests what is in the lyric. It's it, it's embedded in the music itself. And he he just thought that was such a corny suggestion. I uh -huh. could not get him to do it. So I'm glad that you uh, got into the nitty gritty of that song. Well, I have to say that is the one exception. That song. That that the musical analysis to that song is essential, and I credit Eric Lytle, who I think I saw here in this discussion, uh, a colleague at UCLA. I remember once we were talking about the song, and he explained it to me in a way that I had never heard before. So he said, "Look at how the verses, the verses are you're on Earth, you know, you're on the dance floor, uh, and you're cruising, and then listen to how the music, how the chorus." takes you through Patrick Kelly's incredible swoop upwards, the entire chorus happens up here in heaven, you know, in paradise. And we, we then come back down for verse two. And then when we go back up for the chorus to heaven again, uh, it never comes back down. And this to me is that euphoria that the song, and it's, it's a, exactly like you say, it's a purely musical thing by having that hinting in the verses that we're going to do something. It just moves back and forth. It wavers between two chords. And then when he finally, uh, like you should, when you get to that, like you should moment, and then it zooms up to this place in the stratosphere, I think that you're exactly right. That is, to me, the magic of the song with Sylvester and with Patrick Cowley's <laughs> contributions, all of those things. But that, that uh, foundation is essential to its magic. Um, when I moved here from New York in late 1988, oh, I probably should explain that uh, my first record that I bought in New York was actually that 12 inch that you make me feel mighty real 12 inch because it, where I grew up, like if a, if a, it was a big if, if a, a record store would get the 12 inch, it would be gone, you know, a month later. So I went to Disco Mat. It's at, it was actually called that in, in Times Square and bought that. And uh, when I had heard that um, Sylvester had marched, well, he didn't march. He was pushed in a wheelchair for um, the LGBT Pride Festival in 1988. Um, I said to my editors, this guy, he's not going to be around forever. Let's celebrate his life um, while he's still around. So they sent me to San Francisco to interview him. And so it was really his last significant interview before he died. Um, and I had seen him perform in New York. Um, I believe it was at the time of, of someone like you. Um, or someone like you. And uh, it was at the Red Parrot, I think, it, which was a sort of a celebrity club. And as we were walking in, the, my friend and I, as we were walking in, Tony Bennett walks out. Mm -hmm. So it's that it's not a gay, it's not the kind of tribal euphoric spaces that we're talking about. It's, it's a place where, you know, people go to see and be seen. And he performed and it was just to a tape and the audience wasn't that into it. And he invited people up on the, in the audience. And, you know, I and my friend looked up and, and we ended up like jumping on the stage and dancing with Sylvester. But I say that because when I interviewed him, he was really at the end of his life and nothing can, nothing can, prepare you for the shock of, of seeing someone in, in that state. 
uh, it was probably you know the most challenging thing I've ever done as a journalist, but it it led to me uh, moving here. Um, and when I moved here, it it struck me how tribal San Francisco is. That you know we joke about the gay agenda, right? But but I found that many people here they they come here to come out and and in order to cope with the all what that means they they find themselves in a group you know like a leather group or a twink group or uh, a bear group or something and i'm wondering given all those kind of micro biases micro yeah uh, how did you deal with like, how did you find the re the reliable narrators of this book? Yeah. Uh, well, before I answer that question, I just want to say that that article, uh, your interview with Sylvester, is is so important. I think it's the first time it was responsible. I think for setting Sylvester's context up. Do you know what I mean? You're the first person to really say, "Here's Sylvester. Here's what he did, and here's why he matters." And I, I just found that really moving and very valuable. Uh, and by, by opening with that, the sort of the vignette of him in the march in his wheelchair, um, you, you sort of, you beautifully set up this sort of, so visual, the, the imagery you set up. And I just, then by going back and discussing the coquettes and all of that stuff is just, I don't know, it's just really important. And I think when people think about who Sylvester was, um, again, that's really the first time that that got put in context. So thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful interview. Thank you. Um, so I, I found that something really interesting was that the Trocadero transfer, um, which was sort of the headquarters for the San Francisco Sound. It was an after hours club and it was tribally organized in that club. And I, different people you talk to say, well, okay, here is where what would they say that the Pacific Islanders, that's what they, the Pacific Islanders were here and they knew that their spot was by the women's room in this corner. The bears hung out over here by this table. And this was called, what did they call it? Bear country. And so the bears knew to hang out there and the twinks were over here and the uh, fan twirlers, they were over here. And, you know, everybody, every little tribe had their spot. And so I have to say, it seems like other than the political gaze, if I want to be super dismissive, uh, and no offense, the journalists, that's the political <laughs> gaze, right? They were the only ones not included, it seemed like, in this scene. The people who were writing for the gay press, because they hated this music. You know, the, the gay press was so disparaging of dance music and disco in general. And um, essentially a chapter I cut from the book is the response to punk versus disco at that moment, really the response to post-punk as queer post-punk is starting to happen in San Francisco, getting embraced by the journalistic community, the gay journalists in, in town saying, finally, a music that speaks to, you know, about our struggle that is no longer this mindless, repetitive party music. Uh, the fact that in 77, what was it? Saturday Night Fever got one star, the soundtrack, and uh, the Sex Pistols got, or the Ramones got, you know, album of the year in the gay journal, in the Bay Area Reporter. Um, to me, is it's so interesting. And, and the, the sort of antipathy to disco, particularly from within the gay community, the uh, establishment gay community, I guess you could say, the respectable gays versus the party gays. Uh, the troclodytes, the press called them, or the castroids, <laughs> you know, uh, this constant dismissal uh, of, of what they were doing um, was real. So I think like I, the reason, getting back to your question, the, the reason why it's so interesting to me is that the Trocadero did have a lot of these tribes together and their stories seem to corroborate each other, you know, in, in a lot of ways. They're like, oh yeah, remember when they played this song? That's what a lot of the stories were like. So it didn't matter what tribe they came from. It was about the music uh, and sort of the collective um, 
the collective experience that brought them together on the dance floor? Um, so uh, given that uh, drugs are one of the four Ds that you mentioned in your book, did you, did you have the nerve to ask people about the drug use or did they volunteer it? Um, yeah, most people volunteered, I have to say. I did, in fact, I left a couple of stories out because I was like, I can't say this. I mean, they're talking about all this illegal activity and they're still alive. Like oh, one of my sure. informants was talked, you know, openly about being a drug dealer. Um, and another another one of my informants were like, oh yeah, everybody knew that guy was a drug dealer. If you needed this, you went to him. He's still around. I mean, these people are still here. So, you know, San Francisco, they were just so open about stuff that little repressed me from the Midwest. I'm like, I can't say that in my book. I'm not gonna, you know, what if your mother reads it? <laughs> well, you know, um... When I moved here, there was the, the best record store was only a couple blocks away from me and people were dying. And it was also when people were divesting their record collections and replacing them with CDs. So all the records that were hanging on the wall in, in the record, the disco or, or dance music record stores in New York were available to buy and I bought just hundreds and hundreds, thousands, really thousands. Um, and the guy who owned the place, unbeknownst to me, he was dealing drugs out of the store and he was killed. Um, oh, wow. so, yeah, uh, so uh, You've brought up the, the how what how close how close the the things that as I I guess I said the the things that that set us free also really enslaved us. Um, uh, I, I given that I think we're supposed to be uh, talking about um, or opening things up for questions. Uh, and I, I've, I've also been asked to talk about my book. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll maybe I should start with that and then uh, open things up. Um, my, my book started really, the idea of it started when I left the San Francisco Examiner back in, um, in 1997. Uh, I knew <clears throat> Vito Russo, who had written The Celluloid Closet. Uh, that was like the first book to read the movie history from a gay perspective. I wanted to do uh, a, a music book that, that did the same thing. And I even met with um, his agent but uh, I wasn't really ready. I, I did not, I was very naive to how, what a, writing a book proposal involves. And so I, I did it for a while and I ran out of money and I had to, you know, support myself by writing uh, journalism as, as much as I could. But um, I, I picked it up a few years ago and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a challenge to go from that regular high of writing for a, an online publication or writing for something where you see your name in print and getting that, like having a beginning and an end of the process coming within a few days or at least weeks of each other. You know, it's like I, I've been writing, I've been making singles for all my life and now I've got to make an album and this album, it's it's really like a box set because I'm I'm tracing pretty much from from Stonewall to it, you know I intended to do until the present day, but I, I realized that that was just impossible because the present day keeps on happening. So um, I'm I'm 
I'm tracing it more or less from Stonewall and maybe a little before to the, the end of the millennium. And uh, I, I, your book is extraordinarily, um, it, it, it's extraordinarily researched and it, it's a different thing to, um, for me, I, I realize, you know, I, I, I did, a, I mean, I have done huge amounts of research, but I realized that, well, what people, people want to hear my perspective on things and I need to trust in my perspective. And, and in, in the process of the book, I've, I've, I've written myself in as a participant or an observer, like, what was it like to see the word bisexual and homosexual for the first time in print when I was 11 years old in describing David Bowie? And, and what, what did that do to me? Um, what was it like, uh, you know, hearing Sylvester or, or hearing all like working at Tower Records when Small Town Boy came on and, and listening to it for the first time and, and hearing, you know, my own story and the story of so many people. Um, so I've, I've, I've been trying to balance all those things. Um, and it's, I have over a hundred thousand words written and <laughs> I'm still going, still going on. Um, You're right. I mean, I am very interested in hearing this story, hearing your, your impressions of these things as someone who was there, who knows what they're talking about, who has the context, I guess. Well, well thank you. Um, so uh, since we're get getting close to the uh, hour mark, um, let's open. I don't have the questions. So uh, moderator, do. please step in and For uh, sure. trans transition to that. Okay. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Lewis and Barry. This is just so fascinating and um, yeah, just such important historical and cultural stuff that both of you are doing. I can't wait for Barry's book when it, um, when it arrives. Um, so the first two questions were both musical questions about form and um, Ethan just had a quick question about um, hi hat, the offbeat hi hat. Um, Ethan, if you do, you want to ask that? Sure. Hi, Lewis. Congrats. Hi. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the offbeat hi hat opening, very being uh, you know being very um, iconic of the disco sound, and it's in my experience as a percussionist. You know, it's not a particularly common thing to come across. Um, and one, one area it does come, come up quite a bit is the music traditions out of the Caribbean, Afro-Cuban and Afro-Caribbean, uh, music styles such as Soca and Calypso. And I was wondering if you had known any of the potential relationships, if there are any, either forward or backward or side to side, you know, what have you, um, with that what I find to be kind of a rarer way to play the kit. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ethan. That's, a, that's such a great question, great observation. And uh, this, the offbeat hi-hat in, in dance music essentially is one of those rare examples where you can find, an, you know, there's an origin story for it. And it's, you know, the first time it was used, Earl Young talks about it being uh, in the, um, Oh my God, now I'm blanking out. In the, the Love I Lost? The Love I Lost, thank you so much. Yes, in The Love <laughs> I Lost, where it's used in the way it will be used in disco. I wouldn't call it The Love I Lost a disco song, but but as a way of uh, rewarding the listener. It, it ends up being like a release when that offbeat hi-hat comes in. Um, because up till then, uh, Young had just sort of messed around on the drums and then finally you get to the love i lost chorus and you get that moment and it just sort of carries you along it's like you're being you're like you're surfing on a wave at that moment and its connection to uh sort of caribbean music is so interesting and i had never thought about that i'm glad that there's a percussionist here and i'd love to talk to you more about that ethan 
because yeah. I don't know anything about that that connection because I think tempo wise it seems what makes you want to dance with the offbeat hi-hat is the faster tempo and when I think of the slower tempos of the music you're describing I wonder if the effect is the same um anyway something I would again love to talk with you about yeah I, I thank you so much and I'll I'll, I'll take a look at this recording and see if I can connect some dots as well. Yeah, yeah, love, I, uh, love I Lost, correct? Yes. I, I, I'd you. like to step in. Um, one of the reasons why I think I'm able to do what I do is that my <clears throat> I have a, a much older sister who uh, was a dance teacher. And so I grew up with dancing in my family. And I also played drums. And I think I mean, when you put that out there, I think, okay, the bass drum, it, it grounds you, but that offbeat hi-hat, it takes you up. It, you know, it's that thing that makes you go like this before you go like this again. So it, it, it's an elevating thing. So really in the mechanics of disco, there is elevation built in and, and it, 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 it distinguishes it from a conventional, R and B that is just the the downbeat and the snare, uh, the, the 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 alternation between the um, the bass and the snare. And I I would also I mean just riffing off this stuff, it is it is also something that it, it it's a transition. It, it's not like if you were to look at like the bass. Gay music is really bass music. It's really four on the floor music. Uh, and back in the 80s, when when Janet Jackson, you know, came out with Control and and uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis really accentuated the snare. It, it, it I hate to say it's a it, it is a straighter sound. It's a more rigid sound. And that 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 upbeat, I think it 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 uh, there's something queer about it. it. It's it's like another syncopation that that gives you uplift and power that wouldn't ordinarily be there. I think it also, um, not to belabor the point, but I think it also lives in the moment in a way that the sort of teleologically driven music. Uh, that is like really taking you somewhere. The minute you're elevated with that offbeat hi hat, you are in you're in bliss. You're dancing. It's the reason why a song that's ostensibly as dumb as Doctor's Orders takes you somewhere. You know, as soon as she starts singing, uh, the offbeat hi hat comes in. You are with Carol Douglas on that dance. You know, and and you're singing to the doctor. And it's the same in um, Never Can Say Goodbye. Gloria Gaynor's Never Can Say Goodbye. When that offbeat hi hat comes in, you're totally transported during those offbeat hi-hat moments and I just close my eyes and you just want to spin you know because you're not trying to go anywhere you're just living in that moment uh yeah that's how I see it thank you Jacqueline do you want to ask her question about the baseline rising baseline for sure. Um, but first, I want to say, Barry, I, I feel like somebody should write a study of big sisters and how they are musical guides, because that story <laughs> is so common and important. Um, but yeah, Lewis, I wanted to ask you about the the, the rising bass line, which, sorry, can you hear my dog whining? I'm just okay. exasperating. I really apologize. Um, I mean, it's a walking bass line. It's not you know it's existed before disco and you talked about it, you kind of presented a little like almost like a biography of the sound which I loved and I wondered if you know can talk about the kind of the history pre Larry Graham and where sorry, and where you see the sound going um later on because yeah. to, to me it is such a signifier unmistakable signifier of disco um and and I'd, I'd never yeah really thought about its life outside of that yeah uh well I talked with this I talked about this with the straightest person I know, Lauren Kajkawa. <laughs> and he was the one who was like, no, this comes from Larry Graham. You know, it's not a gay thing. You, This is, you know, this is a funk thing. This comes from funk. And I, and I listened to it and I, I agree with Lauren, uh, but Larry Graham uses it in very different ways. He is not interested in 
the that four on the floor and then how how that do, 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 sort of very regularness of it larry graham of course is all over the place and it's about funk uh so it's a it's a very different so even that connection i would say is already fairly tenuous and i think it would be a good project if brian wright wasn't so into his motown and we could get him to start thinking about disco music then, uh, which I tried when he was my graduate student at the University of Nevada, I tried and he's like, no, thank you. But <laughs> get him to think about that history of the bass and how it works, I think would be fascinating. And it's such a great, a great unexplored uh, aspect of the bass, of the electric bass. And of course, then the synthesized bass when uh, Patrick Cowley deploys it. So I have no answer for you. Sorry, Jacqueline. Okay, Morgan's comment was about intergenerational connections through the music. Morgan, do you want to say more on that? Oh, okay. Hello, is Morgan here? Okay, maybe not. Okay, um, well, I can ask my own question, which was about uh, various phrase, uh, the tribal euphoric energy of San Francisco. Um, where do you feel like the energy has, or how has it transformed in terms of here now? Do you, are there spaces um, as the San Franciscan where you feel that energy still? Mm -hmm. um, well, the first thing that came to mind was when I moved, you know, uh, I, uh, at NYU, I was a cinema studies major in the in the grad department, and uh, <laughs> you know, if you living in New York in the '80s, I was exposed to the best of the best. I'm not, I uh, you know, and and when I came to San Francisco, the film festival, the LGBTQ film festival, was way beyond what New York had. And the audiences were way beyond what New York had in that you would um, you would go to a movie and it was like going to a black church where people would participate in like the gospel. They would yell at the screen. They would they would boo the the villain and and uh, you know cheer for the the hero. Um, that movie culture is obviously for many different reasons that are economic and uh, generational, that, that is dying. But I, I do want to point out that at the, the uh, parties that, um, the Go Bang parties that Lewis and I have attended, that um, the, the audience at, I mean, the people dancing, really spanned several generations. Um, you see a lot of kids in their 20s getting really, really high off this stuff. It's, it's very gratifying to see them have the same reaction that I had when I was their age. Um, Lewis, do you want to comment on that? I can I can second what you're saying about the movie culture. There's nothing like seeing Mommy Dearest uh, <laughs> in the Castro Theater. Uh, actually, seeing All That Heaven Allows um, in the theater, where where you're with a bunch of gay people who all know the lines just like me, right? So we're all sort of screaming, and I'm like, this is what I do at home by myself. Like we were talking before, like when I watch Valley of the Dolls or when I watch the women, people talk about there's no gay culture, what are you talking about? There is there is gay culture. Um, certainly there's a bougie middle-class gay culture that I've always been a part of and sharing it with my bougie middle-class, mostly white uh, San Francisco scene. You know, that's something we didn't talk about. You know, the relative homogeneity of San Francisco versus a place like New York, I think it is forces the sort of subdivision into these wonderfully artificial subcategories like you said but yeah the movie thing is so true but i was shocked too about the all the and they these weren't hipsters at at go bang these were like 
not that there's anything wrong with being a hipster. These were just like cool teens and early 20s people who were just, who had somehow discovered the music on the internet, I assume, you know, on the TikToks. And they had, you know, found all, all of this stuff. And it was just really cool. And they'd all come together and, you know, and like, let's go, let's go to this place, this sort of weirdo place. But, you know, the stud has always been uh, headquarters for that that kind of a diverse scene, unlike a lot of the other, unlike the, the Trocadero transfer or, or I-Beam maybe, the I-Beam in the 80s and 90s, you may have a memory of this, seems to be, even though they had category nights, you know, themes for whatever, it was a headquarters of some of the most interesting post-punk bands that made their way through San Francisco. And that was started as a gay disco and became more interesting and wide ranging as it, as it struggled to survive, I guess you could say. And, and uh, Francesca, I, I want to add that um, I think that really the LGBTQ movement is now driven by the trans experience. Um, oh, absolutely. I, I have uh, stepchildren and um, my stepdaughter's best friend, uh, well, it goes beyond that, but uh, she's trans. and having her in my life really keeps me on my toes to think about gender and experience to, you know, because I'm writing my book, not just as a gay man. I mean, I will always be defined by that, but I want to capture as best as I can, use all my empathetic powers, all my imagination to be able to, to, to see as much as I can through their eyes, what it's like. Because, well, when I was uh, an 11 year old, I was, I mean, it's probably bizarre to think, but I was mistaken for a girl on a regular basis, simply because I was into David Bowie. And, and you know, what, when you become a David Bowie fan, you, you know, it, it, at the time you have to leave behind what, the what kids in your suburban junior high are wearing and thinking and so uh i i try to tap into that too and and having that around me in my life definitely you know pushes me ahead thanks for that both of you um rob do you want to make your comment about Richard Dyer's work. Hmm. But, um, just the fact you mentioned earlier that uh, I'm sorry. We can't really hear you. I'm sorry. I, I just made a comment about Richard Dyer being the first scholar I ever heard of who had any respect for disco in response to the comment that back then really not many critics had any respect for disco. That was all. And that was, I think his essay was 1979. It was very early. Okay. Yeah, that and sorry, what very what you say? Oh, I I I remember that essay very well, the the dark disco, as he I think that was the essay that that it inspired me a lot to uh that 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 disco isn't merely euphoria. It 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 has a lot of of profound sadness in it too. Um that that that's usually glossed over by those who look at disco as something monolithic that that it, it has more emotional emotional um content in it even if the even if the the lyrics are uh upbeat um that's something I get into time and time again in my book that is central to the gay experience of trying to put on a happy face while facing discrimination. 
while facing, you know, the, in the seventies, if you were yourself, if you came out, you could lose everything. Um, and yet people did it because it, it, you know, the, the drive to be one's authentic self is so important. And if you can't do it in your daily life, then you were driven to do it within the disco experience, um, to come to terms with, you know, the emotions that brought you to tears when you were at Go Bang um, in the midst of all that happiness. Yeah, I feel like the the defensive disco aspect shows you just how defensive <laughs> Dyer had felt he had to be at the beginning. And to me, the article that really, really had a huge influence on me was the uh, Walter Hughes Empire of the Beat, because he was seemed to be the first journalist who was attempting to understand the music, right? Just to say music is doing something really important here, and let's try to get at the heart of that. And as a musicologist, I find that really interesting. Whereas Richard Dyer was, oh, seems to be in that long list of wonderful British scholars who are essentially sociologists, you know? And um, again, which is great, but there was for so long, no Americans writing about this music um, and certainly not writing about the music. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Eric Lytle has a question for Lewis about dream projects. Oh, my dream projects. Well, that's a great question, Eric. The dream project is this, uh, this uh, live music jukebox DJ transition period. That's what I'm, that's what I'm starting to work on. Now, was Walter Hughes an academic? <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. I know so not supposed to look at the chat. That's embarrassing. It reads. It reads like he knows what he's talking about. So I'm sorry, Walter, uh, if you are around. But um, so yeah. So this idea of studying these jukeboxes more in depth, finding out what I can about that, um, digging back into the archives and getting to use all that stuff. I mean, the punk, the punk, post punk. San Francisco project is very much there. And the, in particular, there's the work of a, a group called Automatic Pilot that was a spinoff of the uh, San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, who were a comedy punk band in the late 70s, early 80s. And um, I'm interested in working on something to do with them. They're very cool. And again, they're essentially a queer core in 1979, which is which is awesome. So yeah, just lots of gay stuff, but uh, but mostly this jukebox thing. Awesome, and um, I see that Carl has a question about punk versus disco oppositions. Yeah, hi, this has been great. Thank you both so much. Um, this has been, you've touched on this a couple of times, but I was so amused by the description of the, of the uh, journalists and the political gaze uh, turning their nose up at the dance gaze and the way that that um, worked out. And it, it made me think, you know, in, in London and New York, and I would say um, in Toronto to some degree too, uh, where I am, you know, in the late seventies, in the queer side of punk, um, that opposition between the dance floor and punk and post-punk and political activism, there was, there was a lot more, things were a lot more Cross crossover in those centers, I think, and you know, famously the Mud Club or Danceteria, all of that kind of thing. But I think that when you're talking about the San Francisco scene, it does feel like you're touching on something that was really solid and also widespread. I think outside of those metropolitan centers, and I was just thinking about you know, and you sort of touched on this with the I Beam about the process of reconciliation. You know, I certainly feel that by the turn of the millennium, that that opposition was kind of over and there was a you know and and punks were using drum machines and all over the place and and there was a kind of grassroots queer punk dance culture and when i think of like queer cores beginnings in san francisco and the relationship between that scene and the club scenes and of course this is all mid-aids post-aids so yeah i was just curious how you see that 
process, and this is for both of you, of, of those things having been at some point kind of united and perhaps separating and then and then coming back together? Yeah, Barry, do you? Um, <clears throat> this is something I've, I've gotten into in my book um, and have written about because I used to go to the Mud Club in Danceteria and in some cases danced with my boyfriends or my gay friends and never did I encounter homophobia. Um, my, uh, my, my, my high school, I, I was sort of, I, I, I could give you many examples, but in New York, I did not experience that schism between disco and punk. Um, and so I was sort of startled that it became such a thing in San Francisco. Um, Lewis, do you want to? Yeah, I think I think the uh, was it the Muni Madness that was to me the the center of this situation where the Muni was opening its Castro Street station, and they had two DJs. They had a rock slash punk dj and a disco dj and this it was like a literal battle erupted with people throwing things and protesting sylvester on the stage because sylvester was a guest star at that event and uh it, it caused you know what the journalists described as as a riot you know at the event where the the disco dollies were up against the punk gays and how their two musical cultures could not intersect. And I think things like that, that were in, in primarily the gay press, that never made it out of the gay press, I think are completely overblown because what almost every gay DJ was playing by 1981 was rock disco. You know, the form of, they would be mixing in Ian Drury, they'd be mixing in Talking Heads, all of these things in with their disco sets and other kinds of interest, as long as it was interesting, you know, post-punk. And all of the DJs I talked to said, nobody was interested in just playing dance music or just playing the San Francisco sound. It was it was a how interesting the music scene was in the early eighties. And why would you reject? Cause all of it had a good beat, it seemed like. And so, so the truth is a lot more, you know, there was a lot more collaboration and a lot less of that division, I would say. It, it's in the press that you see that division. Yeah. Um, of course, maybe people are talking with rose-colored glasses now, remembering back into the music they would play. But I listened to sets. This is now a good time to plug um, Jim Hopkins' amazing Disco Preservation Society yes. <clears throat> website because he has preserved hundreds of DJ sets and they're all just free for you to listen to uh, and to download. Um, they're incredible, an incredible resource of uh, from all over the place, from New York, from Philadelphia, from uh, Chicago, and from lots from San Francisco. Um, and you can hear that in those sets from 81, 82, 83, um, all of that music, you know, that supposedly divine in her show, what was it Neon? Um, neon Women? Neon Women, yeah. Her show was supposedly the invention of, uh, of disco rock. <laughs> it's so interesting that that she would be the perfect articulation of that, the kind of, is it ironic? Is it sincere? Is it camp? Is it what? You know, and you bring in the electric guitars or, or Edith Massey, someone like that, her her career as a punk artist. So, yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up uh, Jim Hopkins uh, website. I believe it's it, the San Francisco Disco Preservation Society is how to get at it. And I've you know, I I, I wasn't at every club on every night, but, um, you know, there were played like Crisco Disco would play hours of disco and then you would hear London Calling. Um, you would hear um, Elton Motello, Jet Boy, Jet Girl. Uh, and it, it first, the the juxtaposition of the punk stuff and the disco stuff was, was more disruptive. But um, while preparing for this interview, I listened to a set from 
the number one DJ in San Francisco, Bobby Vitoretti. I want to make sure to mention his name here because I think his talent really drove a lot of the scene. And just as records in New York, a lot of the music that was disco but came out after the disco peak, a lot of it was made specifically for the Paradise Garage. A lot of the high energy was made specifically for the Trocadero. And uh, he's playing, it's a six hour set in LA and it starts out with the pretenders and all sorts of dance rock. And it, he, unlike a lot of, of the rock DJs who would just sort of quickly transition from one track to another, he would beat mix and he could do, he was an extraordinary mixer. And so he could mix a lot of things that other people could not and make the transitions super smooth. So by 83, you have him playing Stray Cats in the same set that you would hear so many men, so little time. The, the you know, the touchstone UK high energy record from which all the others, you know, followed. But then what he would also do to, to highlight the drug aspect of the culture, he would phase those records one beat apart. So you'd yeah. have this bizarre swirling effect in the club too, and it would be perfect. So you'd think, where do I get this version of the record? Of course you couldn't, you could only hear it at the Trocadero transfer, you know, and then add in uh, all of these sound effects and to, to sort of add to this incredible experience at the Trocadero. Yeah, Vitori is the absolute best. Listen to some of his sets. I highly recommend it. Well, this is fantastic. And um, I guess we should probably wrap up, right? And um, if you're both feeling good about, about that, um, I wanted to thank everybody. We all, on behalf of um, the committee, um, thanks for coming and for participating. And I just wanted to plug our next two panels that are coming up. Um, on October 4th, we're going to have um, a set of speakers from the um, Japanese 33 and a half um, series. And then on October 18th, um, Ricky Rodriguez is going to be talking about his book which I have here, and um, a, kiss, a Kiss Across the Ocean, Transatlantic Intimacies of British Post-Punk and U.S. Latinidad. Um, and um, I think it's gonna be a great conversation coming up. And um, thank you again, this is terrific.